and Benjamin, the intrepid and self-effacing and humble participant in today's um, conversation. All right. And I'm Jana. I don't even know how to respond to that, really. <laughs> it's a very atypical introduction. <laughs> Hi, Ben. How's it going? Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Jana Reese and Dr. Benjamin Knoll. We'll get to know them more in our first conversation and find out more about their backgrounds, but the two of them have put together the largest and most scientific study of Mormon opinions, uh, and they've put together a book called The Next Mormons. So this is going to be a fun conversation. In this first segment, we're going to talk about how do you get a simple random sample of Mormons when they're such a small part of the population. So check out our conversation. Hey, also, if you would like this book right here, I'm going to be giving one away. So please sign up for my newsletter. Go to gospeltangents.com slash newsletter. And newsletter subscribers, by the way, are already signed up. So if you're already signed up, you don't need to sign up again. But for those of you who would like a copy of this book, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll do a drawing on the last segment, uh, which will be segment six, by the way, and uh, I will give away this version of the book. So you won't want to miss it. And if you want to read a fantastic book, I've read it, and it is a fantastic book. Now back to our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I have two amazing guests. Could you go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm Jana Reese, the author of The Next Mormons. Do you want to hold up your book? Oh, sure. And the fact that my shirt matches the book is entirely a coincidence. <laughs> I just wear this color a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, we're excited to talk about the, the next Mormons. And you are? And I am Benjamin Knoll. I am Jana's friend and research assistant. All right. Well, we'd like more to get to that. know you guys a little bit more. <laughs> anyway. So can you give us a little background? I always like to know people's academic history and that sort of a thing. And I know you're, you're a big blogger, so. Well, uh, my academic peregrinations. This could take us all day, but um, the short version is that I have an MDiv from a Protestant seminary. I was intending to be a pastor, actually. Became a Mormon while I was a seminary student, so I needed to find a job. And I thought, what have I done all my life except go to school? I'll go to school! <laughs> so I went to graduate school. I got a doctorate in American religious history from Columbia University. But while I was in graduate school, I was reviewing books every week for an outlet called Kirkus, and I did that for many years, and parlayed that actually in my last year of grad school into a full-time job at Publishers Weekly. So instead of going into academia, I took this detour into publishing and editing and have never looked back. Oh, wow. So you're still doing a lot of that? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, cool. And Ben, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. I grew up in Idaho and Cache Valley, Utah. Uh, went to Utah State University, got a political oh, nice. science degree. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, and then after that, went to Iowa for four years for uh, graduate school. My wife and I moved out there. Um, my wife got a degree in foreign language education and then came here to Kentucky for a job when I graduated. And I've been teaching for nine years at Center College in Danville, Kentucky, and that's what I do. And so your PhD is in? in political science as political well. Political science. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So, because I understand you're the statistician of the book. I was, yes. Um, I, my role in this was to help Jana put together the survey and to field it, and then to do some of the analysis and uh, contribute in that way, mm -hmm. uh, which was great because that was uh, me being able to take my academic training um, within the American politics field. I specialized in public opinion and voting behavior and survey methodology in my PhD program. And that's what I do at Center College is teach classes on that and how we measure public opinion and how we get um, snapshots to try to explain what people think and how they behave in politics. And that lent itself well to a project like that, just taking religious behavior and attitudes as opposed to political behavior and attitudes. Well, this is awesome. So I'm excited. I interview a lot of, of historians, but you are my first statistician. <laughs> and, and I teach statistics at uh, oh, Utah perfect. Valley University. So I hope we don't bore people, but I really want to pick your brain <laughs> a lot on that this. Works. So uh, in fact, let's go there because I know um, 
with the Pew Research Study, I believe, um, and some of those big ones. Oh, I was going to ask you, are you a big Nate Silver fan? Of course, of course. 538.com. <laughs> I was there from the beginning websites. before he went to ESPN. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I constantly talk about 538.com and The Hidden Brain, which I think is, is a great one. Um, and free economics. Those are my three favorite statistics podcasts. So, so, but I understand Mormons are only about two percent of the population, or and less. so, yeah. yeah. And so, how does one go about doing a survey of Mormons and getting a representative sample? Because um, I do know. Well, we can talk about some of these things that were surprising here. But how do you do that? Because I'm going to use this information for my class. So just you know, no pressure or anything. <laughs> No, that works. Uh, no, you identified exactly the tricky thing about trying to uh, get small groups in the U.S. population, whether they be religious groups, social groups, political groups, etc. Usually when people try to do national surveys to get pictures and make uh, inferences about what people think and how they behave, uh, the standard for the last couple of decades has been random digit dialing. Just about everyone in the United States has a telephone. And so for the second half of the 20th century, it was um, just generate a computer program that will just do random digit dialing and have a bunch of people in a room and make phone calls until you are able to collect uh, enough responses so that you are confident that the sample that you get is representative of the population as a whole. And the size is dependent on how much error you're willing to tolerate in that. So the bigger the sample, the smaller the error, and the more confident you are that whatever you see in your sample is likely close to, although you're never 100% certain that it's exactly um, in line with what the population is, uh, you can be very, very confident that it's within a certain percentage points of that. And so we took that same approach um, except that because everything's going online these days. So this is the big trend in public opinion surveys um, over the last five to ten years. Uh, at first, internet samples were not very well quality because the key thing is that you're getting everyone having an equal chance of participating in the survey. And so for many, many years, a telephone survey was a good idea because just about everyone has a telephone. And of course, not everyone takes the survey, but you generally have different types of people being as equally likely to say no thank you or don't ever call me again and hang up the phone. <laughs> um, and, and so it worked because even though not everyone would answer, we'd still get enough eventually amongst the various different groups in society to be able to make pretty good inferences about what the larger groups within uh, society thinks. But as technology has changed and caller ID became a thing, fewer and fewer people start uh, answering their phones and being willing to talk to people if they don't see the phone number on there. And so there are a lot of survey firms who have been working for the last 10 years or so to uh, take internet surveys and improve the methodology of them so that we can get responses that are uh, approximately as good, if not sometimes better, than random digit telephone surveys. And so that's what we were able to do. We contracted with a firm who has been a leader in developing these methodologies and um, has been an approach that has been used successfully uh, not only by Pew Research but other social scientists who have tried to get at Mormons in the population. Because for the very reason that you're talking about, it's 2% at best of the U.S. population. So when we make these uh, telephone surveys, that means that one out of every 50 people, if you're random digit dialing, is going to be uh, someone who says, yes, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's a lot of man hours you get to go through to make so many calls to get several hundred, if not at least a thousand surveys uh, completed there. And that's just simply not feasible unless you're a big, big, big organization who can do that. So uh, some of the only ones that have been done at a national level have been the Pew Research Center because they have the resources and they've got the employees and they've got everything to be able to do that. Uh, so back when uh, the 2012 presidential election was going on, they did a, uh, a nationwide thousand respondent survey of Mormons in America and they were able to get those resources to be able to get a good random sample of that. And then they do the uh, Religious Landscape Survey, which has, was it 80,000 responses? I think it was over 100, actually. 100, yeah, I, so it, it's I huge and it huge. Right um, which means that even the small religious groups in society, such as uh, members of the Jewish faith, or Latter-day Saints, or Jehovah's Witnesses, et cetera, et cetera, there will be several hundred of them within that 
survey to be able to draw meaningful inferences about that. And in recent years, Pews also began to supplement their telephone surveys with online surveys. And so that's the direction that this is going. So we come in right at this level where we're taking advantage of these um, online survey firms who have tweaked this methodology and used it um, to try to get good representative samples of the population as a whole. That said, we did well, let some... me interrupt and oh, just say it. we both yes. overestimated 35,071 ah, respondents we go. in the 2014 one. So okay, that really works. Yeah, so even with that 35,000, that means that they can get the margin of error there to less than about 1% or less, which is amazing for public opinion survey research. But that means even amongst Latter-day Saints, I think they had about 600 within their survey, which led to about a 4% margin of error for the Pew Religious Landscape Survey. So we look to the Pew surveys as to my knowledge, the most representative telephone, but also supplemented with internet-based surveys that have been done of small religious groups, including Latter-day Saints. And so we use them as a benchmark and said, okay, this is, to the extent of our knowledge, this is the most representative picture of what Mormons in America look like. And so we took that survey and looked at it and said, okay, about how many people in this survey are of these various age groups, of these demographic groups, of these uh, geographical groups, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, when we did the online survey, put in some uh, constrictions to make sure that the responses we were getting were matching up with those various uh, demographic indicators from the Pew Research Survey. So that, for example, if we know from the Pew Research Survey that X percent of people who say that they're LDS in the United States are of this age category, that in our survey we get that many as well. Um, and so through... So you were trying to match the Pew Survey, basically? Yes, we use that as the benchmark by assessing the representativeness of our sample. And uh, yeah, so, so after it all came in, uh, I took a look at that on a variety of different demographic indicators, compared it to the Pew Center, and found that except for a few variables, it had done a pretty good job of getting an approximately uh, similar picture of Mormons in America as the Pew Research Center surveys had done. There were a few that were a little bit off, and so and this is very common in public opinion survey research, is if you have a good idea of what the population uh, parameters are for a particular survey, and you find that you got some biases in the sample that you took, you can use something, it's called a post-stratification weighting procedure. <laughs> to, we, we talk about that very basic, we just call it weighting in my class. There we go. <laughs> you yes. weight the responses. Yes. Correct, correct. So essentially, if you've got a group in your sample that's a bit bigger than your benchmark looks like uh, it is, uh, you can artificially deflate the weight of those answers a little bit so it matches up more with the national. And then vice versa, too. If you don't get enough of this group, you can artificially inflate their answers um, so that the uh, results that you're getting in your survey look approximately like those over here so that increases your confidence that the responses then are then representative of the nation at large. Okay, so let me ask you a question there. So it sounds like the Pew's study did a survey of almost 36,000 people and 600 of them were Mormons. So, I mean, I guess that's, if you were doing a random sample, you'd have to talk to 36,000 people to get 600 Mormons. Is that safe to say? I mean, is that yeah, representative? Apparently. Yeah. yeah. So most well, people and we are. should add, too, that our survey, for people even taking it online, the average was 35 minutes, right, to take it online. Can you imagine trying to have this conversation On the where, phone? A, where, yes, a, you are being called uh, by this random person and saying, we need approximately two to three hours of your time to take <laughs> a survey? I mean, that's not going to yeah. happen. So yeah. in, in some ways, the online component enables us to have more information and a longer experience than the, the old way. At the end of the day, we had nearly 500 different variables, questions in the survey uh, between the various things. I mean, not that many in terms of like the questions, questions, but in terms of uh, different options that the survey respondents were able to either indicate or select, it was very, very big. Now, do you, and I don't want to get too mathy on people here, and I'm afraid that this question might you be. You do too. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I don't get to talk to a mathematician ever, so this is awesome. But do you worry about like any collinearity problems with, with your data in that you have too many variables and so they might uh, correlate with each other? Um, when it comes to the analysis of the data, well, of course, that's always a check that you're going to be doing in trying to see is this variable more highly associated with another variable 
or not. In sampling, though, that's not necessarily an issue, right? Because um, collinearity is just simply when we have two variables that look very, very similar, are they measuring approximately the same thing or not? That wouldn't be a problem for just collecting the sample and seeing what the trends are. Now, if we're trying to explain an outcome, like are people more or less likely to attend church more often? Are they more or less likely to identify strongly as a member of the church? And you're trying to predict their responses using other variables in the survey, and you've got two that look nearly identical, um, like one's measuring frequency of prayer and the other's measuring frequency of feeling God's presence or something like that. And just for the sake of argument, let's say that the people who said yes to both at approximately the same rates are more or less identical in those two variables, then the statistical procedure is not going to be able to tease out well the independent effects of each of those. So in a situation like that, yes, we would do tests for multicollinearity and make sure that there is enough difference between the various variables and then uh, make corrections if necessary in order to get the most parsimonious explanation that we can. All right. Well, I think we've nerded that enough on the map. <laughs> so we'll, we'll save that for a little bit later. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Jana Reese and Dr. Benjamin Knoll. <laughs> in our next conversation, we're going to talk about how they would react if they found out that someone, such as me, might have misused their data. Oh, I think any use of data with teenagers in, in the uh, approach of good parenting is entirely valid. <laughs> no ethical qualms with that whatsoever. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.